good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, session where we have uh, a featured poet with us today, Nipuni Ranavira, the author of uh, Take Me in Small Doses, uh, published in uh, 2021 by Paw Print Publishers Colombo. Uh, Nipuni, in addition to being a poet, is also an academic, a lecturer at the uh, Department of uh, Language, Language Studies at the Open University uh, of Sri Lanka. Uh, she's also a lawyer and someone who takes a deep interest in uh, both uh, teaching, uh, writing, as well as uh, research related to uh, literature. Uh, welcome, Nipuni. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Vihanga. Thank you, the other participants, for inviting me yeah. to share my poetry. So to start off with Nipuni, let's uh, just uh, have a few things uh, set up for people um, who might not be too familiar with your work and the way you work to understand uh, your uh, ethic a little bit better and your approach mm -hmm. to writing a little bit better. Uh, we can start off by uh, you sharing uh, in a few words. Uh, Take me in small doses, your debut collection, uh, how it came about, what it's about, and uh, what it means to you. Maybe in a few words as a brief uh, introduction. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Yeah, so uh, Take Me in Small Doses is, as you know, a collection of poetry, um, which, which came uh, out in 2021, which was actually published in 2021, but uh, due to certain circumstances in the country, as well as personal circumstances, it, it was launched actually in 2022, uh, quite recently. And uh, I'm happy to say that people have been noticing it so far. And that's always uh, rewarding. Um, yeah, so it's a collection of poems which uh, sort of deal with, uh, I've been told like by critics as well, so uh, deal with uh, issues such as motherhood, mothering and womanhood, being a woman in Sri Lanka, as well as uh, teen cultures, girlhood cultures, cultures as well as certain uh, ethnic tensions um, in Sri Lanka. So um, I, I don't, I haven't really sort of... Uh, divided the book as some poets do into, you know, like thematic strands. Uh, I, I like to think that the poems flow from one to another, uh, sort of, uh, you know, quite organically. And uh, yeah, so that it, it, it has about, uh, yeah, about 62 points uh, of varying lengths. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I've been actually now sharing, sharing the poems uh, with multiple audiences and I'm sort of engaging with the reactions that I, that I get. All right. So um, writing this book, like putting these poems together in a collection, what did it mean to you? Because one of the biggest problems we encounter as writers is to actually muster the courage and take that, uh, uh, take that uh, very important step uh, by keeping your right foot forward to go mm -hmm. ahead and, you know, uh, publish the work. Yeah. So how did that uh, come about for you? Like, yeah, um, that's an interesting question. I guess, um, I mean, I am a very, uh, I like to call myself an introvert. I'm not, not a very public person who likes to sort of share my poetry. So in, in my way, poetry, in my initial way, at least, poetry was not meant to be like, you know, shared necessarily. But then, um, you know, if, if I had ever sort of imagined myself writing a book or, you know, launching a book, I would have uh, sort of imagined myself doing it you know, privately, you know, I, I, I probably bring a book out and then sort of um, share it with the world uh, out of the blue, just like that. But what, what really happened was uh, my, my sort of pathway into publishing was more gradual and sort of uh, marked with uh, many engagements with uh, fellow poets and other sort of writerly communities and so on. So, uh, so the first point I, I've written and sort of uh, shared with other audiences was um, they, they were they were sort of uh, shared online, right? so I uh, found myself um, sharing certain points of mine um, on, on uh, certain uh, poetry platforms like uh, Primrose writing, Primrose uh, Road poetry, for instance. You know, which is which is a very um, valuable sort of forum or platform for because it has I think introduced many new writers and, and new writing uh, to to you know, Sri Lankan audiences and and other. 
uh, sort of forums, fora like poetry uh, com, and you know very popular like you know uh, poetry forums or fora where you can uh, basically you know share just expose your poems, right? No, no big deal. And then uh, there came came a stage where I was sort of working on uh, Instagram and I was sharing poems on, on Instagram and. So, um, you know, gradually, uh, you know, I, I sort of uh, got comfortable with the idea that uh, readers were engaging with my work and people were responding. And as you know, online, it can be very um, instant and sort of that, that the connection the, between writer and reader is formed and it, it can be very uh, sort of, even to, a, to an introvert like me, uh, you know, getting people to sort of uh, notice your poetry and, and hearing nice things about your poetry can be very gratifying. And uh, I, I think I sort of started to sort of grapple with the idea of, you know, bringing a book out to people, people when, when, especially when, you know, readers, your readers sort of suggest it and so on. And uh, then, then I, I guess I uh, sort of, uh, that, that's, that's the point from where I uh, met my publishers, corporate publishers and publishing company and where I had the initial conversations with them. And, you know, after going through my work, they sort of liked what they saw. and. Uh, that, that, that's, I think, where the book sort of came about. <laughs> oh, so, Nipuni, what kind of writer are you? Now, for example, uh, we have people in Sri Lanka, uh, leading writers like uh, uh, Ashok Ferry, for example, who publishes a book every other year. Then mm -hmm. we have poets like Vivi Murray Vanderputen, who publishes once every five years. Shehan <laughs> Karnath, like a once a decade. And then, of course, we have... Uh, Maraka Katha Chakravarti, people like Demon Anand, who famously, you know, sat down at his desk at night and uh, when dawn broke, he had already finished yet another masterpiece, right? How does writing work for you, Nipuni? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, again, like, see this book coming about uh, and, and the poems that I've been writing. I mean, it's not that I haven't been writing, you know, all these years now. But, I started writing as a child and then went on uh, writing as a teenager. And uh, you know, although I, I, I might not have sort of published consistently, you know, apart from this very odd appearance in newspapers and all that, um, it's not that I was not writing, but uh, I guess I was writing sporadically. Like, uh, but at the same time, you know, writing poetry is also a very sort of instinctive sort of activity for me. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm not boasting or anything, but I don't have to take a lot of effort to you know, write a poem, you know, just sit down and write a poem and when you're sort of engaging it, in it as a, as a vocation, I think it's very important that, that you really have a passion for it and that you um, you feel as if you're you are enjoying it, enjoying the process and not necessarily the outcome, you know, publishing or sort of sharing your poem with other people. But I think the sort of the act of writing itself that can be uh, rewarding for you, I think that's, that's very important. Uh, so that, that's what I meant when I said uh, it, it's instinctive and uh, also I, I, I don't know like from, from very young age I, I like the idea of working around with uh, rhythm and rhyme. I have a very rudimentary sort of knowledge of music, very very basic but uh, I don't know whether that had an influence and uh, uh, so rhyme and rhythm uh, uh, sort of appeal to me always and uh, I, I guess that sort of uh, Help me into you know uh, thinking more seriously about writing poetry. <laughs> yeah. All right. So from uh, what you shared, what I what I gather is that you have an instinctive kind of approach, uh, which you have been uh, nurturing from a very young age, uh, coming mm -hmm. to to poetry. But in mm -hmm. addition to all that, uh, I mean, as valid as all that is, are there any? Uh, global or classical writers who, who influenced your craft or the way you look at literature over time? Some of the bigger yeah. or lesser gods uh, who probably uh, <laughs> influenced you in your outlook on yeah. literature. Yeah, I guess um, I, I, I like, uh, I particularly like um, Adrian Risch and uh, I guess Margaret Atwood. Uh, so especially, I'm particularly fond of uh, Adrian Rich and her sort of um, very restrained style of writing and how how um, how she has sort of evolved and, and the sheer volume of her works. I mean, she's something that they've been writing for like years, like decades, three or four decades. And it started when she was uh, like a woman in her 20s and went on till, I think, 
pretty like very 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 and she was a like an older like very old uh, poet and uh, that's uh, I, I, that's the point I really admire. And uh, also academically, also I happen to be interested in both these writers, uh, Adrian Rich and Margaret Atwood. So that might be, be another reason. Um, uh, I also uh, like I also like the work of uh, Alice Walker. And uh, yeah, so, so they would be and, and in the Sri Lankan context. I particularly admire Richard D. Salsa, uh, especially his love poems. <laughs> All right, so I think that is a very good cue for us to get down to a little bit of uh, your poetry, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. probably uh, we can very easily accommodate uh, 20 minutes of uh, reading time, after which okay. we can go into more conversation. Uh, so Nipuni, yeah. it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so I will read uh, Sort of reading, uh, sort of sharing with you a uh, poem from Take Me in Small Doses. I have the book here with me. And um, so uh, this is titled uh, The 90s Girl. So, as I told you before, uh, uh, school teachers and, uh, you know, uh, girlhood, girlhood uh, have been you know, an abiding interest of mine. And I think that is sort of uh, reflected in, my, in some of my poems. And so this is about, um, about actually, I, I'm trying to imagine, not that I was a rebel in, in my school days, but I was trying to imagine a, a rebel uh, who sort of um, defined, sort of defied certain um, rules and, and regulations that are often set up at, at schools. And, uh, and, and then also this notion of, uh, what I mean by the 90s girl is that uh, there, there are certain um, uh, tendencies and uh, certain notions associated with 90s girlhood, uh, you know, things like Spice Girls and, uh, and, and, and popular and a very popular sort of version of uh, girl power and, and all that. So I was trying to articulate and, and you know, this like, I went to school in the 90s as well as a little of the 20s. But uh, I think the, the word 90s has a, has, a, has a nice ring to it as well as sort of brings back certain uh, uh, but I, I guess ideas and, and notions associated with this kind of uh, girlhood. So, so uh, I think I'd better read it quite. Yeah. So uh, the 90s girl, they say the kerosene she took was too much for her and that she didn't last the night. She was always way too much, that sparkly 90s child. Her uniform was way too high and she sassed glum faced perfect too many a time over socks that were folded once, not twice, and sleeves that were tight, and novels full of vice. She stared back a little too long at gangly youths kept calling her, and men feared the look of derisive appraisal she too often gave them, and her name was splattered with obscene epithets on the walls of that chaste school. The teachers stuttered in this pool, you can't clap with one single hand, they said. The other 15 year olds walked primly with heads downcast and bodies slouching, while she, she walked with a sensuous lilt of hips and something illicit glittered on her lips. While we, sweet pigtailed girls, readers of chaste Mallory Towers, would get up only to the right kind of mischief. She would be pulled up for songbooks, letters from boys, for eyes shining too brightly, for shaved legs, for hair not bound tightly, Spice Girls clubs and imaginary lovers. Still in the aftermath of the shock, I finger a sparkly songbook. Beneath an already feeling sticker of Wonder Woman, she has crawled, girl power rocks. Um, I will go to my. Okay, so this is titled um, The Roommate. Uh, I wrote this poem at a time, I, I mean, not that I wrote it, I wrote it quite recently, but the, the sort of the idea came to me at a time when uh, Sri Lanka was, uh, you know, going on. Uh, you know, there's a lot of discourse about uh, post war reconciliation and about 
reconciliating uh, sort of um, you know forging sort of forming connections with with, with the north with people of the north and there was all it, it was all very, all very sort of positive sounding and then there's a lot of um, it is it all almost sounded to me uh, too good to be true i mean is, is it so easy to sort of form connections uh, and and i was trying to sort of imagine uh, two two individuals who were you know removed from all these all these realities uh, these realities of uh, politics and war and who would who had uh, the chance to occupy a room with their roommates at a campus or another institution whatever and i wanted to imagine how it would be uh, two people two, in, two women of two cultures uh, to sort of inhabit uh, a room together uh, despite all you know, you know on one hand the, the negative connotations of you know being somebody, somebody from being an alien and on the other hand all the positive jargon about positive discourse about uh, you know uh, putting everything you know behind you and forming uh, positive connections right so this title the roommate how little i was to know that the space between our beds would form a metaphorical chasm of fates, a shuddering ocean of churning cultural turmoil. If I had fond visions of us garlanding each other's hair with jasmine and sharing Nibia sweets and whatnot, and being a sparkling example of post-war reconciliation, I was sorely put right by the dismay in her kindly face upon seeing that she had a new roommate. Her gods disliked the smell of meats and eggs, and I, the tinkling bell at the dawn puja, and her saffron sprinkling didn't quite sanitize the fact that I menstruated in a different week. No, our cycles didn't synchronize. A pure wedge, sari or shalva clad, an unseen IT fiance tucked away in the States. She seemed to me too holy, too exotic. She, in turn, didn't quite know what to make of my crop tops or long line of shady wall friends. Over the question of the desecrating mouse, we had our first disagreement. I was non veg but pro-life and thought the mouse was rather cute. She proved pro-rat poison, but then there was this tiny carcass that she wouldn't remove, not even with gloves. Maybe by offering to take the mouse out, Sadly, I still thought it cute. I had proven my merit, but anyhow, after the mandatory cleansing and incense, it seemed that we had passed some kind of impasse and we could fathom each other through a different lens. So we drink, drink tea together for now and give the jasmine a pass and begin to dismantle an invisible fence and find each other rather nice. We drink to the fact that nothing works like a cause to break into cultural ice. Um, I think I'll clear the air with a last point. Yeah. <laughs> and all this talk about <laughs> politics and war. Um, this is called an offline love story. An offline love story. In a crowded room, our eyes meet with a warm challenge fulfilled. Our looks tender, teasing, and knowledge of promises broken, of faiths shaken, dissolves tenderly without accusation. And like the breaking of wall, separating land, they come together, our hands. And no one will see this moment. No one will flash a camera or check the status. Other moments so immortalized will rain on screens and on walls shine while our own, offline, out of sight, grace gently a corner of my mind. So I come to my final poem, I think. This is out of a collection that has been, um, this is like just a random poem that is not, it's not in the book. Uh, I think I'm sort of, I'm still working on, but I'd like to share it with you. It's titled, uh, it's a poem that I'm particularly fond of. It's titled All the Times, and I, I think I've shared it uh, online as well. And um, it's about, you know, it's a little little uh, connected to this offline love story in the sense that uh, people nowadays, lovers, you know, have, um, you know, many, many ways of communicating with each other. And, and so I, I'm trying to uh, sort of imagine 
and, and sat rather long for a time when uh, you know somebody uh, when somebody or two, two individuals being unable to communicate you know in that degree of frequency and, and, and you know ease and where, where people are sort of hampered by other um, you know by external factors so this, this is called all the times if I had loved you and you me in all the times, in grander style, I could have made pretexts for your silence. Our missiles would have got mixed up as doves rested for water. Files of sleep inducing drugs would have kept you fresh and safe till my return. Our letters would have tossed and turned and languished on ships floating precariously on deathly seas, handkerchiefs and bedclothes or stained underwear, could have taken the blame for this impasse. Then I would never have seen you blinking obscenely in some bright online sphere, distant, but only a mouse click away, a mouse that neither of us would click. No, I prefer the older times, and if I had loved you, and you, me, in all the times, in grander style, I prefer the random chance of seeing the back of your head, half blocked by some beam in some god forsaken station as my train inevitably pulled off, covering your whip with steam. <laughs> yeah, that's all I think. <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nipani, for that uh, very, uh, I would say engaging and also diverse dose of uh, poetry, uh, starting from dead rats to mouse, uh, clicking of mouses, <laughs> right? So very wide range uh, poetry, uh, poetry of loves present and loves absent. So maybe we can take a few minutes if people want to engage in conversation, if you have any uh, ideas or insights you would like to share. Uh, while questions form, uh, Nipuni, if you don't mind me, uh, like uh, indulging your mind on this aspect, because part of our interaction, I think uh, the, the interaction this group has had uh, was extensively spent uh, discussing uh, editorial aspects and the composition of uh, drafts, right, as a part of the creative process. Uh, would you like to like share some ideas how editing works for you? And how you uh, prepare yeah. drafts? Are you one of those people who uh, take a liking towards multiple drafts piled on top of uh, one another? Or do you like uh, more or less go with an instinctive flow? Any any ideas you would like to share with us? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who sort of was, was pretty old fashioned in you know, writing. I, I just uh, an idea might strike me and I, I might have, I mean, I might actually you know, scribble uh, in, in whatever surface that, that sort of, um, you know, sort of is, is available to me. And I, I've been, uh, I've actually been known to sort of lose a, a poem, a good poem, you know, I've just simply lost it. I've just written it somewhere and I've lost it. So I've, uh, among other things, I've not been known to scribble on, you know, tables and <laughs> back of uh, old school notebooks, um, you know, people's work, uh, work folders and all that right so so that that's so much for the act of writing but despite being a very messy person i uh, I, I try to at least I'm, I'm not not saying that i do it all the time but i try to take editing very very seriously um so um, i think it's very really important that you sort of come back to your work and in whatever form you know it might be the book or an old diary or in on your laptop or whatever but i think it's very important that you come and sort of revisit what you have written especially in poetry. So I, I, I try to do that. I'm not that I have been very, you know, always uh, consistent, but I try to come back and uh, sort of read it, read it out and then uh, see how uh, the techniques work. And, uh, and then sort of down the line, I think it's very, very important that you sort of uh, at least engage the services of uh, a good editor. I mean, I'm, I'm, no, it doesn't have to be formally all the time, but uh, even for me, you know, when when I was uh, I was thinking of publishing, and then my publisher publishers offering uh, sort of the way they engage with my work uh, really helped me to sort of uh, sort of improve myself and, and to see see certain sort of uh, issues that that would have otherwise been there. 
and I think, uh, and I, I think, uh, at least in the Sri Lankan context, from what I can see, um, it's not that poets uh, sort of or writers uh, lack poetic, you know, what is called poetic sentiment. You know, sentiments are all there. So the problems are with, with the techniques, I think. So the, so editing, I think, really uh, helps with that. Uh, you know, helps with the with the sort of uh, fine tuning your techniques and then your uh, poetic uh, devices, whatever. Right? So I, th I think that that's really really important. Nipuni, because you've been saying that uh, you've been uh, writing though inconsistently and maybe not uh, too publicly uh, over a period of time, starting from your childhood. Uh, mm -hmm. By the way of reflecting on your own personal growth, how would you mm -hmm. say that you have changed now from, say, the poet or the writer you were, uh, let's say in your late teens or your early twenties, mm -hmm. what are some of the key yeah. key changes you have seen, uh, and are they for the best or are they for <laughs> the worst? Yeah. So as I've told you before, so I probably sort of published my first my first ten or eleven um, uh, children's uh, page, but but uh, children's you know like a poetry page, and then you know for school or whatever. But but the, I think for me the real writing phase, you know, my, my first real you know where, where I started writing again. Now I'm, I'm using this word instinctively where, where I I was writing for myself, not necessarily. So when you are a kid, you obviously write for school, <laughs> and your parents tell you to write or whatever. But when you are, uh, I think it is as you said in my uh, late teens that I sort of started writing. Uh, for myself uh, without any thought of uh, sort of sharing it except with the, with the very uh, you know one or two dear friends I, I wouldn't have I, I I was not writing you know for, for a wider audience right so I, I think uh, and I also have to say that, that they, they were like very bleak uh, melancholy poems you know borrowing heavily from uh, the romantic period you know where you were sort of wallowing self to be you know in love and you fall in fall out of love and all that and I'm glad that they're not published, right? But um, uh, one thing I see myself becoming is uh, more restrained, uh, more restrained than I guess. But I don't know if it's a good thing. Uh, I, I think my first poems were, had, had that energy and kind of you know, that, that draw aspect uh, that you get, you know, when, when you're a teenager and you're full of angst. Uh, still full of angst, but I, I, I've learned to sort of, <laughs> sort of uh, yeah, restrain myself more. Um, I guess, uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether this comes from being a teacher and, and engaging with certain, you know, with, 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 with certain literary aspects uh, and, and, and in teaching and all that. Uh, that had sort of led me into uh, sort of working with uh, multiple issues, you know, my current uh, social, political, cultural realities that I, I was not really aware of or I was not simply concerned enough to write about you know as a teenager so that was that is all like you know out of the heart and all that. but now I think I engage with um, with what I see and then sometimes I, it doesn't happen all the time I, I try to be as involuntary as possible I, I, I don't you know, I, I generally don't sort of pick a theme because it's fashionable or uh, you know then that doesn't work with me as I told in another forum also I, the, the poem just comes to me I mean I, it, 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 I, I can't sort of, um, you know, look at the theme or, or, or a set of techniques and then write. But I think a degree of consciousness had somehow uh, seeped into my poetry now. You know, now I sort of know what I'm doing and uh, I, I keep um, whatever uh, the certain issues in my mind and then certain themes that I, uh, you know, li like to work with. Yeah, so that would be the sort of the journey, yeah, evolution. <laughs> okay, so like. Uh... As a take home for all of us now, since uh, uh, take me in small doses is almost uh, one year old. It's almost one year old. It's uh, survived through its first year and with uh, moderate success too. Uh, what is coming down the pipeline? What is your next step? Where do you see your poetry going in the next year, year and a half? Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I, as I told you, why. I have been writing, uh, I've been sort of putting together another collection and hopefully um, I, I'll try to sort of uh, form a, a second volume. And uh, I mean, it, it's, as I told you before, it, 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 it has become the 
the practice of writing has become has gained so much focus since publishing and the time sort of feel as if i know where i'm going and i i know sort of what to expect also and uh, so and then it it appeals to me you know the idea of sharing uh, your work with, with others and then uh, yeah, so writing, writing for a wider audience, and uh, and uh, meanwhile, I think I, I I will anyway be engaging with the uh, with the online community with with the with the online sort of practice of writing, and uh, because that has uh, I mean it, as I told you, it's not something that had occurred to me before, but it's, I find uh, the sort of the um, the connections that one forges, uh, you know, while you are writing online, they are also very very uh, rewarding because. Uh, you get to engage and interact with uh, one with, with other writers as, as well as readers, uh, so that that that's the kind of connection that you don't necessarily feel when you sort of launch a book and you sort of place that book in a book rack in some bookshop. Right? So you you have people um, sort of actively sharing your work, actively engaging with it, recommending it to other people, and uh, it it so somehow the poem um, uh, takes uh, sort of a life. Of its own. So I, was, I recently wrote this uh, poem about a transgender woman, and I was telling Vihang also um, how uh, the transgender community, like how, how a certain uh, transgender community, uh, some some individuals uh, sort of uh, picked on it, and they, and they really appreciated it, and they, they wanted to do uh, like a reading on it, and, and they gave it, you know, uh, interpretation that I had not, not even th thought about, and, and that 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 is really very very rewarding. All right, so thank you Nipuni once again for uh, joining us uh, on a, a Saturday week weekend, no doubt uh, with uh, so many things lined up, but very thoughtful and uh, generous of you uh, to honor our invitation, join and share not only your poetry, but also many insights and thoughts that go into the writing process. So I think uh, moving forward uh, as a keen audience, we'll be looking forward to that uh, second collection which seems more reality in the making right and mm -hmm. we, uh, i think uh, unanimous in uh, wishing you all the very best for where your poetry takes you uh, thank you very much Nipun. thank you Vihanga, and thank you all the participants who uh, joined and who listened to me thank you so much